Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Then I pay my special respect to all the fallen heroes from Spring Revolution in Myanmar. I also thank all the panel, especially Professor Shantano, for all your effort for Myanmar. Finally, thank you all our participants from different parts of the world to join AMI seminar this evening. Our AMI President Christopher Lam will open the meeting. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, May Chair. And I won't use time, which is scarce, for a long speech at this stage, except to say that I'm really pleased that we're able to have Sean with us today. Also with us, of course, is Tue Tue Thane, who is a very distinguished Burmese economist in Perth at Curtin University, and Tim Harcourt from the University of Technology, Sydney, who just waved in a good way. Our speakers, Sean Turnell, Tue Tue Thane, and Tim Harcourt will take us through the earlier part of the evening. Then we get to the questions and answers. As usual, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat room and the moderator will work out how to present those questions to the speakers. Uh, we're going to be looking, of course, at the future, what needs to be done in Myanmar to help the economy recover when that time, when that date comes. We're not going to spend time looking at the past, but everybody knows what a terrible thing has happened to the country and what awful things are being done by the military regime. And one of the examples of that is Sean himself, but he won't be speaking about that tonight. So we start. Sean will speak for 15 minutes and the floor is his. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. And um, thank you, everyone. Let me give an apology at the start, but there's something wrong with my computer and it looks like I'm talking into a periscope. <laughs> so uh, consider yourselves all submariners and you've you've sighted the target. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you to everyone of AMI for organising this. Um, and it's a, really an honour and a pleasure to speak to you um, because the fact that I'm speaking to you means that I'm free. <laughs> so that in itself is something worth uh, celebrating for me. Um, I also, though, wanted to use this opportunity to thank everyone. Um, Many of you, all of you probably have heard me thank people more broadly for everything that Australia did and the, the free world, if I can use that expression, to get me released. Um, but I owe a special duty of thanks, uh, firstly, to the Burmese community in Australia and, and around the world, but also the Burmese community as sort of more expansively considered to include the scholars and all the people who have had interest in that country uh, and it's just phenomenal, the support that I've got from all sorts of people. Um, one of the things I'm doing at the moment, of course, is that I'm writing a book about the experiences. But in order to do that, I have to recall everything that I went through. But even more than that, I, I've been reconstructing the events outside and, and all the things that my wife did, the correspondence she had and so on. And I'm just overwhelmed again, uh, let, well, overwhelmed with her actions for a start. But uh, the network that built around her and and people, I'm uh, Tim Harcourt's here on this, uh, one of the speakers. Uh, just the work that people have did is just phenomenal. And and um, but I'm thankful to everyone basically. And and by doing this talk tonight, it gives me a shorthand way of saying thank you to everyone. I know many of you have been in contact with me individually since as well, and I thank you for that correspondence. Hopefully, I've replied to you. If I haven't. Really, great apologies, uh, but it really is heartfelt, just my thanks to, as I say, the Burmese community, I think in its the broadest consideration of that, both um, uh, Burmese nationals, but also people just uh, who love the country, of which there's always a sizable number and much bigger than we think. So that's the first thing I wanted to get across, it's just simply that. Um, the second thing is just to uh, infidelity to Chris's, um, uh, well, the, the topic matter tonight and and uh, Chris's uh, advice on that, which is to talk about the future uh, and the future of the economy. Uh, uh, first thing I suppose to say is that uh, it's going to be a huge task. Uh, I noticed about a week ago, or no, it was only a couple of days ago, actually somebody from the UN made a, a comment with respect to the broader position of Myanmar 
and that was that there was regression across just about every sector, uh, every aspect of life in, in Myanmar. And certainly that's the case uh, with the economy. Um, I, I've done just some estimates myself on, on what is the um, what has been the regression, like how, how far back are we starting in order to look forward, but you know, where is the starting line? And very conservatively, uh, by which I mean I've included uh, damage done by COVID, uh, but compared that to where we should have been, even with the COVID damage in place, but say if the policy framework had continued other than that, and my estimates, again, very conservative, is that the economy would be at least 20% bigger than it is now, 25% probably, but you know, very significantly bigger. So, and given that Myanmar before was one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, it's had the starting line just push back so much further now. So, but I guess we know that, right, that the task is going to be a big one. It's made harder, I think, by the fact that the catch-up, if you like, is all the more difficult because it's not really the mechanical aspects of the economy. It's not the ability to extract energy or extract resources or to plant crops. None of that is damaged. The physicality of Myanmar, for the most part, uh, is more or less as it was, although, of course, there's access issues to do with uh, with parts of the country uh, as the conflict goes on. But to me, the biggest damage for the economy uh, is the other stuff, those critical institutions, institutions of trust that allow economic activity to take place. And so that's what I, I guess I want to put my focus on, uh, is where we might go from those, because those are the ones I think that uh, is going to require the biggest effort and also which will be the most difficult. So, yeah, so I wanted to just focus on that. A um, little bit of an apology here because for people who know me, you'll know that my uh, emphasis on Myanmar's economy has always been in the institutional framework, the financial sector, monetary issues and all of that. And I am guilty of being one of those people who, because of that... <coughs> You know, I, I have the monetary hammer and I do see every problem as a nail. So uh, that's also the bit of the focus too. But in some ways, um, I think concentrating on issues of, of money and finance uh, has the extra benefit in that those are areas of, uh, of the economy, of course, that are just about trust. There's no intrinsic value in monetary units. They're all just promises to pay in the end. There's no physicality to anything to do with that part of the economy. So to some extent, if one was to say, well, where do we start and where do we go in those institutional features of the economy, it seems to me that concentrating or having a look at finance and monetary issues is not a bad place to start. Um, but funnily enough, I'm going to be a little bit um, optimistic in a sense um, and pessimistic in another sense on this particular issue. I might start with the pessimistic part or, or perhaps not pessimistic, but um, I guess a way of thinking about how things might be fixed institutionally that doesn't require people like me. Okay, so I'm a technician of monetary and financial aspects. But I think the ultimate solution to this part of Myanmar's economy are political in the end, right? If, we, if the politics doesn't get right, the conflict continues, if the military continues doing what they're doing, then there's, there's nothing that we can do technically to fix any of this. Um, because once again, you know, financial issues, money as a unit itself is nothing but an item of trust. It's nothing but a promise. So without that being, without a society capable of fulfilling those sorts of promises, then uh, nothing is going to be fixed anyway. So that, that's the pessimistic part, if you like, or just the, the, the signal that uh, in fixing things, it's, it's going to be much big, bigger than simply coming up with various technical solutions. So having said that, though, uh, there are some uh, things that, that can be done. And where the optimism comes in is just simply that we know what to do. And we not only not know what to do in terms of looking around at other countries, we know what to do in terms of Myanmar because it's already been done. Um, it's been done during that period of the of the government from 2016 to 2021, but in particular towards the end, because of course we had COVID and COVID did enormous damage to Myanmar's economy, but it did a couple of positive things, if you like, for the economic planners, the people thinking about how to drive policy and so on. 
and it did two positive things. I think firstly, it thought it required a rethink and there was a pause and people thought, well, where are we? What's going right? What's going wrong? And how can we fix it? That's number one. But then secondly, much greater appetite amongst policy makers to enact the sort of things that uh, policy thinkers, if you like, were, were, were coming up with. And that was documented. We wrote about it all. And, and it's done and it's finished and, and got out there. Then various events intervened, of course, in, in uh, February 2021, and, and none of that saw the light of day. But it's there. It exists. Uh, and what I'm referring to, that, and some of you will know all about this, um, just before the coup in, uh, on February, uh, February 1, uh, we were about to present the government with a set of options about how to recover from COVID and how to reconstruct parts of the economy, uh, how to apply some of the lessons that we'd learnt with experience in Myanmar itself and how to enact reform and so on. But some of the reform experiences and some of the post-COVID recovery policies from around the world as well. Anyway, we brought all of this together in a document called the Myanmar Economic Resilience and Reform Plan. It's done. It's brilliant, I think. Uh, it contains all the things that we didn't want to do, but uh, sorry, did want to do, but couldn't do in the original Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan that came out in about 2016. Uh, for the new government. So the MERP, or the MERP, somebody called it the other day to me, uh, has got a lot of answers to the problems that are needed to build that non-physical part of the economy, things like, again, uh, money and financial aspects. And to give you just a taste, because I know the minutes are, are running out, but to give just a taste of it, one of the things we're going to find uh, in the future is that w whatever the political... Um, well, given some sort of political change, because as I say, it will require that, have no, no doubt at all, um, is uh, to reconstruct the banking system. So Myanmar's banking system was insolvent going into the crisis, going into COVID, going into the coup. Uh, other aspects of the financial system have got much worse since. The um, microfinance sector, for instance, was still running quite well in January of 2021. Uh, non-performing loan rates were still very low. Now they're about 25% in microfinance, which is 25 times what it was January of 2021. Non-performing loans in the banking system are at such levels that the banking system will require uh, not only substantial bailouts, but effectively uh, substantial uh, nationalisation, uh, if you like, to get things back on, back on track. Anyway, I just mentioned those just to say that that, that's the, the seriousness of the problem, uh, but also to say that the techniques for doing all of that uh, is very clear, and it's very clear to policymakers uh, who hopefully will be available uh, when things are able to, um, uh, when, you know, a government that's concerned about growth and development uh, comes back into office in Myanmar. So uh, there's a certain upside on that. Um, I might just finish with a final little comment about uh, the, uh, an area of optimism, and, and that's if I look around at some of the ideas floating around now, I'm extremely impressed by some of the monetary ideas coming out of the uh, National Unity Government, the NUG. The most obvious of those, of course, is the uh, people sometimes label it a cryptocurrency called M NUG Pay. It's actually technically not that. It's something called a stable coin, which is just a modern idea for something that's been around for 200 years called a currency board. Basically, that's what it is. Uh, it just is a new currency backed by older currencies, and that's more or less, as I say, what NUG Pay is. But it's got some nice little uh, digital devices to make it uh, more usable. But to me, that's extremely impressive. As are some of the some of the other thinking about financing the NUG and so on. Um, so I'm taking a lot of optimism from that because it seems to me that uh, the that. The good people of Myanmar have, have not lost any of their ability to be innovative and so on. I think actually the crisis has only driven that higher. Uh, so there's substantial optimism from that. But as I say, so, so many of the ideas and, and where to go forward uh, is ahead of us. And it really, I think, just requires uh, both the political will and then the political circumstances to change. And of course, I might just end on that point because clearly that is where the real action lies uh, in order for things to be better.
Thank you very much indeed. Thank that you. was very interesting. And uh, we will all measure that uh, as we, well, as we uh, have heard it, but we will be able to read the transcript later, hopefully. Uh, that's providing the speakers are happy to see the transcript printed and put into the web. And that will bring it to the attention of other people who have not come on board yet. But we already have almost, I think, a record. But perhaps it is a record of audience participation. We have 119 people at the moment. And we normally get somewhere around 80 or 90 on a good day. So this is a good number. As for the future, the other thing which is important and which I'm sure that uh, Tway Tway and Tim will, will note is that it's very uncertain how the politics are going to evolve. As you would have seen, the military have unveiled a draft election law, which when adopted, and I'm sure it will be adopted by them at least, will basically remove everybody from the elections except for the USDP. And it's very doubtful that that will produce an election result that would be comfortable for those who are looking for a future for the economy. But it also won't inspire the Chinese who have a particular interest in what might happen either. So we'll see how that works out. But bearing in mind what you've said, I now give the floor to Tui Tui. She is an assistant professor at Curtin University in Perth. And welcome to you in your mid-afternoon. Thank you, Professor um, Shant and um, Chris. Yeah, it is an honor to speak here. Sean, thank you very much for um, your knowledge and insights as always, and painting some optimistic picture. I think that really fills in the gap in the um, you know dialogues uh, so far. So I'm going to go straight to what uh, really strike a chord with me when you said about institutions of trust. I think that is, I mean, the te technical aspects of it, you know, it, it's there, it can come back, we've got the framework, but this trust, has it been forever broken? So um, I, I, my, my discipline is international business. And um, so the, the first, first of all, foreign investors trust, you know, I mean, has it been, they have been burned before and now burned again. So will they be very reluctant to come back? So first of all, the, the, the policy certainty, uncertainty, you know, with the banking crisis, um, uh, a policy uh, revoke of the, the, the foreign currency situation, that scared a lot of uh, businesses and hence, and that explains some of the withdrawals, you know, market exit. So businesses are businesses, and uh, not a lot of them are that interested, unfortunately, in business and human rights situation. But some of the exits, actually more exits, you can see because of the, um, the poor business environment, you know, will that come back, you know, to, to inst you know, restore the trust? So that's banking is one thing. You know, policy uncertainty, um, the, the regime being very short of revenue, so uh, grabbing whatever they can, um, that bound to freak out, you know, uh, local and international businesses alike. And another thing is these, you know, civil society institutions, you know, for example, garment manufacturing, you know, garment manufacturers, international labels, especially from the West. They came into Myanmar with the hope that, you know, they can um, do proper due diligence, which they were able to, you know, since about 2011, when the, the dawn of democratic era, when they came back in. Um, and, and it's still very, very important for them to show that their due diligence is proper under the circumstances like this can heightened due diligence is it still possible you know um the unions are gone you know um civil society is non-existent wiped out with this situation how can you do continue doing business that is from a human rights perspective but i also understand the other perspective which is the humanitarian argument which is also valid that people need job you know people um Otherwise, what other options they have, especially youth and women? So that's also an argument. So looking forward, this human rights versus humanitarians argument has come to the fore 
with this Myanmar crisis. So international businesses also a split between the Western businesses where they are bound by their human rights rhetoric, human rights commitments on their website, they declare, and then how can you keep doing business in Myanmar in these circumstances? So this human rights uh, commitment versus humanitarian um, responsibilities, commitments, you know, responsible businesses. So that has perhaps enriched and taken on a, a different sphere that's looking forward. Um, so I would say investor confidence, will it ever come back? Um, so that 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 will be the, what um, I want to say, and I think I, I want to end with this comment. Thank you very much. That's very Thank interesting. You. Thank you, Trey Trey. I might uh, just comment on what you've just said. I made contact with uh, um, oh, uh, people involved with responsible business, and in particular with, uh, oh, God. She's a good friend of mine. I don't know why I've, uh, the name has suddenly left me. Uh, the woman who, the ex-British ambassador, Vicky. Vicky, Vicky Bowman. Bowman. And Vicky, I told her that we were going to have this, and would, and I didn't invite her to take part, but I in this. But I said we might want you in the future, and she said she wants to lie low for the time being because the situation is very unclear for her, and and I can appreciate that because of her family circumstances. But I've seen from Facebook that she's remained active on the general issue of responsible business, and that's good. I'm glad to see that that's happening. The other thing I'd say is that I remember quite well, and you would know better than me, and Sean certainly knows about these things, that when President Thane Sane took office in 2011, there was a feeling around the country that the tide had turned and the country was now on a track that no matter how long it might take, was on the road to a form of democratic management of the country. And so investors looked at that as part yeah. of their plan for the future. It's going to take a very long time for an investor now to see anything, any, any return to liberal democracy as having anything but a short life for as long as the military remain inclined to act as they are now. But let's hear what Tim has to say about all these things. Tim Harcourt from the University of Technology, Sydney, and a very powerful supporter of the Sean Turnell campaign. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chris, and thanks everyone. I just want to say at the outset that uh, I'd really like to thank Chris and his team, uh, of course, with the campaign for Sean. Chris really played a very important leadership role as a former ambassador, along with Nicholas Coppel with the Burmese community and the Australian community here uh, that did so many wonderful things. and. Uh, I've been a close friend and a great admirer of Sean's intellectual prowess uh, for many, many years, uh, but uh, his strength of character and the strength of character of Ha and his sister Lisa and, and Peter, his father, and his mates Curtis helping him in, in, in uh, Myanmar, I've just got a, an enormous respect uh, for, for that strength of character. So great, greatly relieved to be here and greatly honoured to be part of it. So uh, unlike uh, Tway Tway and Sean and the other panellists, I'm not a specialist on Myanmar. I'm the Airport Economist, which happens to be the name of my book series, The Airport Economist, which is a very good book, but not as good as Fiery Dragons by Sean Turnell. I really recommend uh, Sean's book if you want to uh, read a really good book. Uh, but I'm an Airport Economist. So I think I went to 60 countries in five years before COVID, and I think Christopher must have been ambassador for about half of them while I was traveling. And uh, I was convinced by Chris and the AMI team and Sean to go to Myanmar as country number 60. I think uh, Mongolia was 58 and Kazakhstan was 59 and Myanmar was 60 before uh, before COVID and, and, and the troubles that occurred. And um, what struck me was the not only incredible potential performance of the Burmese community at home in, in Australia, but also uh, when we made the Airport Economist Myanmar episode, uh, the great human capital of, uh, of the Burmese people. 
we actually did a, a show around the uh, around uh, Myanmar, interviewing several young Burmese economists and uh, business people. We interviewed a number of Australian business people who were then investing in Myanmar, and we of course of course interviewed uh, uh, Nicholas Koppel and uh, some people at the conference. And um, I was interested in um, everything from. Uh, the work that Ostcham under Jody Weeding was doing. Uh, Chris Hughes, one of the Australian lawyers who was writing the investment code. And uh, Alison Carter, who'd run a, an NGO three, um, it was uh, Three Good Spoons to help uh, young Burmese women get work around the region. So together with NGOs and businesses and uh, uh, the local community, I actually saw a great deal of potential However, uh, we know what happened with COVID. We know what happened uh, with the political situation. Um, there's probably five things that struck me with the, with the future of Myanmar, and they were partly touched on by Sean and by Tui Tui in, in, in her remarks. One is institutions really matter. Um, I've been really influenced by two books. One is called Why Nations Fail, uh, about the role of institutions. And another is Why Australia Prospered by Ian McLean, who was my supervisor at Adelaide. And uh, Ian McLean actually looked at very similar countries, Argentina and Australia, for instance, and looked at the role of institutions in banking, in governance, in democratic politics, and in the rest of the economy and how countries with similar resources and endowments and similar immigration, such as Australia and Argentina, can, can end up at quite a different place. And I've always been thinking about that with respect to Myanmar, when you look at countries like Vietnam uh, and Thailand that have uh, come from positions of uh, relative poverty to uh, reasonable positions in Southeast Asia and, and that, that sort of potential. So firstly, institutions matter, and uh, you can tell that with why nations fail and why Australia prospered. Secondly, uh, when you look at the economic evidence, Democracies work better economically than autocracies. Uh, you can see that in per capita GDP. You can see that in GDP performance. You can see that in export performance. And you can see in those five years when Myanmar was a democracy, how their economic performance has improved under the advice of the Burmese economists and people like Sean that gave them very, very uh, sound advice. So that's something looking forward that will be important. And that goes to the, the third position, which is the geopolitical situation. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, that will matter. Uh, with the Russia-Ukraine war, with the role that now China's playing in the geopolitical situation, that will make uh, a great, uh, a great uh, deal uh, in terms of economic performance. Fourthly, when, when I was there looking at Myanmar when we're doing the show, I just saw the export potential was enormous uh, uh, in uh, agriculture, in resources, and in tourism. I mean, what an incredible cultural endowment that Myanmar has. What an incredible country that uh, uh, has so much to offer. And I think when you think of resource allocation, as Sean has mentioned, you know, you've got the size of Canberra in the military, the over uh, the over resourcing of defence expenditure compared to agriculture and infrastructure and education will make uh, an enormous difference. I noticed when we uh, did the Airport Economist Myanmar special, normally I will go to a country with a, with a host myself, a producer and a, and a cameraman. Uh, we had 20 people, young Burmese, assist us uh, when we made that show. And obviously, uh, obviously an over allocation of resources, but great potential, great potential from where they were starting. So I think that will be very important looking, for, looking forward. And finally, um, uh, as Tuaito showed, the uh, amount of young Burmese economists who have a great deal to offer, um, uh, who are very able, uh, that will make a big difference. So the political situation improves. And the political situation improves and the uh, geopolitical situation improves, then there'll be a great uh, pool of talent to draw from. And I just want to leave my remarks there.
Sorry about that. I just got a message from somebody who said that he'd lost the link to the event, so I've sent it to him. And that will bring our numbers up even further. And they, as I say, are already at a world record. We're now at 124. But thank you for that. Uh, we have a number of people who want to ask questions about things that have to do with institutions. And I think that as Sean made a particular reference to them, it would be good to go to those. Sean, uh, the issue of Myanmar's relationship with the international financial institutions is what's interesting people. How do you think that they will uh, act in the future? And now, if there is a, an honest election, which nobody thinks will happen, that will ease the way for them to come back in. But even they would be looking at the issue of trust for the future. How difficult is it going to be for the next Myanmar regime to uh, bring itself to the favour of those institutions? And we might also, Tong Shui, Dr. Tong Shui, if you're there, we might ask you to comment on the on Sean's answer to this and say what NUG sees itself as doing with the international financial institutions when it has the opportunity to do so. Sean. Thanks, Chris. Um, and as you alluded to, uh, there's no role that I can see or should be no role uh, as well for the World Bank or the IMF or ADB or anyone else at the moment. Um, at some point, though, one would hope that they will have a role uh, once uh, some other sort of political arrangement comes into place. Um, again, as, likewise, as you alluded to, Chris, uh, the, it, it's not going to be coming from a good place. There's so many things that will need reconstructing and all that. Um, again, though, the, the base level that they would work from is not zero. Uh, there was a, a huge amount of cooperation between the previous government and the World Bank, ADB and IMF. Um, you know, I mentioned some of the issues about the financial system and the condition that's in. That condition is very well understood by the IMF and the World Bank. And there was very close, very good cooperation uh, between the previous government and those institutions on that very narrow front. So, uh, so even just looking in that area that I chose, that very slim area that I chose to highlight, I think the IMF and World Bank and the like would play uh, quite a strong role in the future, even though, as I say, I don't think there's a role at the moment, but hopefully soon there will be. Sean, they've maintained their offices in Yangon, is that right? These I institutions? Some of them have, Chris, but they've they've reduced staffing and, and uh, it's really, data is incredibly difficult to come by. Uh, people have probably seen the World Bank has continued to produce the Myanmar Economic Monitor, which is exceptionally good. Um, so they're, they're trying, but um, uh, yeah, staffing levels and all that are, are greatly reduced and, and probably, you know, for good reason, because again, there's, there's not really a lot of work you can do if the data is not available. Thank you. Now, Dr. Tanong Shui, I saw that you're here. Are you able to offer a comment on this? And do you have, are you aware of contact between the NUG and the international financial institutions about the future? Thank you, Chris. Thank you, presenters. Thank you, Sean. And then all your presentations are very resourceful and very insightful. So on behalf of NUG, we do understand that the, the economy is very vulnerable under the military junta. And then in these days, NUG is trying its best to, to, to be able to support the vulnerable communities in Myanmar and they're also learning from the other uh, like-minded organization and also the countries. And then the academies like Professor Tutrite, Professor Shantano. And we also like to learn more from these uh, resources. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And then although they are not an international financial institution, you could say that the Chinese presence in the economy almost amounts to, amounts to that. There are several questions about the position of China on the way Myanmar is likely to develop. And I think these are very speculative, but it's, it's difficult to, uh, to discuss the future without thinking about China and its place in this. Tui Tui, you see these things through a different lens. How do you see the Chinese economic relationship with Myanmar in the future? Yeah, so um, contrary to what others are thinking, I think I'm a little bit optimistic in terms of Chinese um, getting sick of 
the insecurity, you know, damage, possible damage to their investment. So because Chinese has a lot of investment in the country, you know, including this twin pipeline, I would have thought they will worry about their business investment and this, the destabilized Myanmar wouldn't be what they want. So there might be a, a geopolitical advantage that um, NUG and the resistance can tap into. Um, so, you know, you can't even also see the, 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 the continuation of the China Myanmar corridor. And because it is a lot of the parts of the countries are destabilized. So you can't do business in that situation. Um, so, you know, you have this political alliance uh, possible, but if business is not there, I, I think uh, I would say Chinese will have a rethink and that might open up opportunity for the NUG to tap into, I always thought. Thank you. I, I must say that, that that's very similar to the way I think about this and, I, and putting it together with Australia. Australia and China have basically got very similar interests for the future of Myanmar. Both of us want to see a stable country. Both of us want to see a government in power which has the support of its people, which the military, of course, does not have now. Uh, to that extent, uh, we have a lot of interests that merge on this. And I think also neither Australia nor China wants to see a heavy involvement in Myanmar of certain other countries in other parts of the world. Uh, and so that goes for things, if you think of the Chinese position on this, like the supply of weapons by a country in Eastern Europe uh, to the military regime. So th there is an interest there in looking at how a stable future for the economy can be built. When the uh, Thane Sein government came to power, one of the things that I remember having discussions with them about was the importance of having a model created which would see at least commercial law operating in the country for the benefit of business in a way that was reliable and independent and where you had a properly operating system, perhaps you could say something not dissimilar to what Hong Kong was able to achieve, even post the British. And so I think we are still looking to how to get that to happen. And what I'd like personally to see is much more involvement from Canberra in strengthening a relationship with China over how best to help Myanmar out of its present dilemma. Uh, moving from there though, to other questions that there are, there are, uh, there are a lot of questions and those of you who've looked through the questions in the chat room will see what they all are. Um, one of the questions that came, and this was direct to me rather than posted for everyone, I'm not quite sure why, it goes to what Sean was saying about the, the MERT, is that what it was called, Sean? Oh, M-E-R-R-P. M-E-R-R-P. I'm not very good at acronyms. Uh, do you think that the work that was done by you and others before the military stepped in is going to be able to be, to re be recovered or will the country need to look at something quite different? Is it perhaps time to uh, start with a blank page? What sort of economy and, for that matter, body politics should the country have and how should that be put together? If it's all very well to, to pose that as, a, as an academic question, but the reality is there are 55 million people who need to be fed and governed, and, and you can't just have a clean page and start again. You've got to use something as your base. Do you think there's room for doing something very different for the country for the future, for its economy? I, I'm fairly optimistic, um, Chris, about the, the MERP or the MERP, mainly because it was written by... Uh, Myanmar's Burma's best economists. Um, most of them are in prison now, but they're exceptionally good. Um, and people like myself just had a role in, you know, putting eyes on top of, uh, sorry, dots on top of eyes and crosses on T's and so on. Uh, but intellectually, it all came from them. Uh, it very much cognizant of uh, Burma's history and current politics and the need for dramatic political change, you know, as a foundation for it all. So we begin with that absolute prerequisite. But it's a, it's a document that was based on, as I say, what worked and what didn't in the lead out of, of the previous government. Um, I'm, I'm quite confident on it, and mainly because I'm so confident too about the people. Again, uh, with, the, with the hope and expectation 
that they can play the role that they had before, but but even larger, uh, that, that that could do the business. Chris, because I think, um, yeah, a lot of it's been done already. As I said, I'm extremely impressed by the work of the NUG already. And I think a real there's a real meshing of the two. Uh, in the prison, we got to hear about some of the work being done by the NUG. And we had plenty of time to talk about the policies that had been pursued over the last five years. And again, what worked and what didn't and what were the blockages and what we could do next time, because we had a lot of time to think about things and talk about things. Um, so I'm quite bullish on that. And and I know the guys that are just waiting to get out are, um, uh, have the same feeling. So on on that front, I'm I'm optimistic again, uh, fully understanding in everything that I've said that, you know, a, a much bigger dramatic political change needs to happen. But come that, uh, I think some of these other things I'm uh, I'm pretty, pretty confident of that the answers are there. Thank you. I, I'm also an optimist, so I like hearing what you've just said. Going back to uh, international financial institutions and from that to investment, uh, we I raised the issue of China and Tretre gave an answer. Can, Tretre, can you expand on that? How do you see Myanmar's economic relationships with its other neighbours, Thailand in particular, but also India, uh, not to be excluded from this? And then from that, uh, there's the issue which uh, we might go to Tim about because his airport trips have taken him everywhere to thinking about ASEAN and, and what the future is for ASEAN economic cooperation with the country. Will it hold together? Will uh, the Jakarta chairmanship make a difference this year, or are we still going to be marking time? But Tway Tway, thinking about China and the economy and the economic corridors that China is very keen on, uh, what they're trying to do in Chak Pu, what they're unable to be able to take to any real conclusion in the Kokang state and the other places, how do you see China's involvement in the country's economy in the future? Well, two, two strands of thought there. I mean, one, one strand is that they could be taking advantage once again of um, other, um, the vacuum, the vacuum that left by other uh, investors. So there is a, you know, a, um, empty, emptiness there that they can fill, which is, um, you know, that, that, that's a one string of thought that can take advantage of a business as usual, um, and, and uh, you know, start um, re resume investment. But then another thing is that in a country that destabilized and social punishment to um, and the Chinese expatriates there that placed inside the country at the border, will they be safe as well? So there's so much practical concerns but at the same time, there is an opportunity, you know, to get in and, you know, to get their foothold once again um, in the absence of uh, other investors. Okay, thank you. Tim, what do you think about this from your trips to airports all around ASEAN? Yeah, that, thanks, Chris. Um, I, I'll just start with China. I've, I've just finished a, a three uh the third series of uh, The Bigger Picture, which is a show on China and Australia on Ausbiz and also on People's Daily Online. We set up the show because we wanted, we were concerned about the uh, the very difficult relations between Beijing and Canberra under uh, the previous government. And uh, we've interviewed Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull and a uh, number of Chinese business leaders in Australia. The most remarkable thing is that the Chinese ambassador asked to be on the show. And so the last episode I did was just a, a lengthy, lengthy episode with the ambassador himself. So it's clear that China is starting to change its attitudes towards its neighbours, its economic partners, including Australia. Um, it's a question of whether they've genuinely changed uh, you know, the wolf warrior mode and they want to go more softly, softly, or whether it's a tactic to change the tone and do what they're going to do uh, in any case. And so I was actually interested in the role that China played in Myanmar, not only in investment, but also to what extent uh, was their relationship with the, uh, uh, with the Myanmar military played out behind the scenes reasonably strongly. And then to what extent ASEAN has been a good counterweight to that? 
And I've noticed that since the change of government in Australia, uh, Penny Wong's made a big effort on ASEAN uh, and our neighbours in the Pacific so that there is a reasonable counterweight uh, to China in the, in the region. Because uh, not just in Myanmar, there seems to be, uh, as Tui Tui said, some resentment uh, towards uh, Chinese business, towards uh, China's role in certain political changes, and also uh, some financial difficulties that some countries have got in with the Belt and Road uh, uh, initiative uh, in, in the region. Um, the way I see the relationship with China for Australia, there's a famous Woody Allen movie where uh, they say, um, my brother-in-law thinks he's a chicken, so why don't you take him to the psychiatrist? Well, I would, but we need the eggs. Um, I see the relationship with China a little bit like that. Uh, you know, we need to have a relationship with China, whether we like it or not, and uh, I think most countries are in the, in the same boat. Mm. I must say, in ASEAN, um, I've noticed that Professor Hal Hill is on this call, Mr ASEAN himself. So, Chris, uh, you've got Hal here, so you might want to maybe maybe ask him for his comments on uh, on ASEAN. Hal, would you like to offer a comment? Hi, everybody. And hi, especially to my dear friend, Sean Turnell. Wonderful to hear you, Sean. Uh, on ASEAN, my impression is it's not going to lead to a lot. Uh, one would hope that they... They might have a, a low-key approach, which might in, lead to engagement, but the evidence so far uh, is that it's not really going anywhere. I mean, there was Hun Sen's uh, visit last year, which didn't lead anywhere. Indonesia is chairing ASEAN this year, and President Jokowi has made a lot of interesting statements about the importance of engaging with Myanmar, and I'm sure he's quite sincere uh, in those statements. Uh, it just seems to me that as long as ASEAN, uh, any country has veto power within the group, uh, and that would probably mean Cambodia at least, and possibly others, including Thailand, it's just hard to see it moving. Uh, I, I, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but so far there's not a lot of evidence that it's going to achieve anything much. And, and, and thanks again, Sean. It's great to, great to hear you. Thank you very much. Now, back to China again, very briefly. Uh, China has a long history of involvement in mining, timber, gems, and other uh, assets in Myanmar's territory. And there's every belief that, that will continue. One of those things rises now because of rare earths, rare earth materials, in, minerals in Myanmar, and Chinese interest in them. Uh, Sean, in your discussions with people, did you talk much about the way the mining industry is going to have to be uh, reformed or handled in the future? No. Um, in short, Chris, it, it didn't come up. Um, the, if I just make a little bit of a comment on China, but again, just in terms of what happened uh, in the previous government, but also with a view how things can move forward, um, one of the very great successes um, which uh, hopefully we'll see the light at some point, at some time, uh, is just the way in which uh, the previous government came to a, a what turned out, I think, to be a wonderful agreement with China over over some of the projects, which could have been an absolute disaster. Uh, the Jiaopu Special Economic Zone and, and Deep Sea Port is the classic example of it. But the deal that was ultimately uh, brought about by the government was an exceptionally good one and and not only i think a model for myanmar in the future but for other countries in in dealing with china over bri so just to put in i think a little bit of a plug for the work again from the same people the same great economists who wrote up the merp and the msdp and all these economic plans they also proved to be extraordinarily good negotiators with china and other places so um yeah so so just to say it has been been done before with respect to China, and, and again, hopefully that might happen again uh, soon. That's a, that's a very good point. And thinking about negotiators, uh, the very best negotiators are going to have to be assembled when the time comes to negotiate with uh, inevitably the military to get a new future for the country, or if not the current military, but the next leadership group in the military. How do you see the future, Sean, of the military place in the wider economy with the, the big 
military corporations that run so much of the economy now, it's hard to imagine how they will be able to maintain that position once things change. Yeah, that, that, that's right, Chris. I, I think, to be frank, their time is over. Um, I think it's over in terms of, you know, we've seen the consumer boycotts, et cetera, that have taken place in country, which have been extraordinarily effective. But my own personal feeling is that the time for any sort of accommodation with those entities uh, is is gone. Uh, I think um, a new liberalising government just needs to take them out of the picture. Uh, we are running close to the end of our time, uh, but there's time for a few more questions yet. Don't worry about that. And if we have to go further beyond the, the hour, we can for a few minutes more. Um, there are so many questions and so many good ones, it's difficult to consolidate them. But there's one for here about youth. I've been a great believer in the fact that the, the youth have spearheaded the CDM and the main democratic movements in the country. Uh, they will want to be there at the table when those negotiations begin, Sean, that you're referring to. A lot of the people that we know and that Tim's taken pictures of and film of are as old as me. Uh, the country's future is with people who are much younger than that. Perhaps they're younger than their 30s. How do you see them? Perhaps I should ask Tweedway, you're the nearest in age to the group we're talking about, and don't shake your head. <laughs> it doesn't suit you. Uh, how do you see youth fitting into the future? And Sean, how much do young people, young economists understand about the sorts of things you're talking about now? Tweedway, first. Um, youth, I see them as space. The, the leadership uh, struggles with. I think that's also to do with our culture, you know, hierarchical and all that, but it is time now. It is time now to give youth space for their voice because youth has different, you know, different uh, vision. Um, they cannot handle the military anymore. So they're militant, but they want to do it their own way. You know, in the... Um, in the diaspora also, I can see, you know, us, older generation versus youth. And youth wants to do their own way, impatient, you know, want to, yeah, so they, they, they have their own ideas. And I think that's one thing lacking is space for youth in this uh, movement. And that's for diaspora as well as those inside. I think it's time. It hasn't been in our history you know, our culture and, you know, respect for elders and all that. I think it's time youth um, are given space and we hear their voice. Thank you. Sean, how much Just, how yes, much could yeah, you yeah, have Chris, with you? Um, and, and I am a very great distance chronologically from the youth, <laughs> but I had a lot of engagement with them, actually, because uh, for a long time, I was the research director of the Myanmar Development Institute, which was a, a quasi-government agency up there in Naypyidaw. And I had uh, with me about 20 young Myanmar economists, Burmese economists, and they were so, so good. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I have no doubt about that. I do think it's time for the older generation to move aside, in, uh, in, and I would include myself in that. Um, and, uh, but they're extraordinarily able. Um, and and raring to go. Uh, unfortunately, I met a lot of the same people in the prison uh, who were there because of uh, various protests and so on. But I know of many more, of course, who have fought, been forced across the borders and and into other countries, etc. But who uh, the ones I'm in contact with would certainly come back uh, if the events allowed it. And uh, yeah, they're incredibly able. Thank you, Sean. You've actually answered one of the other questions that's been posed by a participant tonight. And, the, and that's about uh, migration and how, how do we get the youth to go back? I think myself, from my contact with people, they will go back in large numbers once it becomes possible. But to get, it, to get the trust that will make them feel they can go back is going to be hard. And that will be a serious task for the next government. With the NUG, Tunong Shui, you've had a remarkable uh, lot of success in persuading people from all the different ethnicities to take part as ministers or as senior bureaucrats with the NUG. There's been very little of that from the military in power. There's actually less from the military now than there was in Nay Wynne's time, in my looking at the country. How do you see, Sean, because of your 
contact with people in jail and before. How do you see the future as something which helps build a good multicultural understanding of the way the economy should run in the future? And I should preface that question or add to that question that I watched with great interest the difficulty that the government, including Aung San Suu Kyi's government, had in working out what to do about issues like the Mitsone Dam in the Kachin state with the Chinese interest, the people in Naypyidaw, etc. How do you see all that for the future? Um, again, like some of my other answers, I think, Chris, I'm optimistic if, if people are given the freedom to engage in the ways that I know that they can. Um, and to sort of merge my last answer with this one, my interactions with the young people at the Myanmar Development Institute is such that I didn't see, you know, they intermingled incredibly well. And they were a highly representative group. Uh, there were kids from all over the place. Um, and, um, you know, I, and I think they would look askance at some of the, the comments and, and general disposition of their elders. So um, I, I felt, you know, just at that sort of personal level, uh, quite confidence in that. Likewise, I think some of the policies that I mentioned earlier were very much about addressing that. Um, again, some of the policy frameworks that were coming out late 2020, late 2021, uh, took on board some of the failures that had been there in the in the previous year, years, of which, of course, the issues that we're talking about now uh, were absolutely central. And there was no shying away from those, actually. They, they were quite directly addressed. So at, at the risk of sounding a bit too optimistic, I, I do think with uh, a different set of political arrangements that these ideas could really <coughs> quickly and, and that there would be a receptive audience to it amongst new policymakers. Okay, thank you. You, you mentioned MEWRP again. Uh, I don't have that document. Uh, have you got a, a link to it or anything? There are older versions of it around. Um, Chris, it, it, it never made, it's not a public document. Um, it, um, it was a document that was going to the cabinet uh, more or less around the time of the, uh, of the coup. So it's one of those ones where uh, it's now in that area, I guess, for ripe for historians and so on to have a look at and, and, um, and economists. I don't mean just as, as I say, I think it's highly, highly relevant. Um, it, it's not a document that's in the public domain at the moment. Um, uh, I, I think on that, uh, there are various versions of it as well. I think it would be, let, let, let's take a place marker on that actually and just see, um, yeah, uh, see how that might be made, uh, made more widely available. Do you know off the top of your head what, which is the latest version of the document? One of uh, our then, participants has got 5.3. Yeah, that, that's about halfway through the process. Okay, so therefore, Dr. T, keep that in mind as you, as you work with, with 5.3, and we'll see how we can go with that. All right, I think that we've come to a point where we need to stop. We, we're now after 7 o'clock. Melbourne time. We've had a very good roll up of people. There are still 180 in here, and that's really good. And it just shows the interest there is in the subject. Uh, we will come back to these topics that were explored by Sean, Tway Tway, and Tim as the year goes on. And we'll put a lot more emphasis, I think I have to say, on the economy and social issues than we have in the past, and of course on health. AMI is working to support a health project being put forward by the Australian New Zealand doctors, and that's very good. But for that and a bunch of other things, we're going to have to improve our ability to, um, to get DFAT to understand that a new way has to be found to bring assistance to people at the community level. We can do that from AMI through our contacts with communities and groups who work with them, but it's not possible to do it in a way that would be trusted by most of the communities if the vehicle was one of the UN organizations or any of them. But thank you very much for everything you've given us tonight and for a wonderful set of uh, questions and participation. It's been very good. Thank you so much and we'll see you in a month.